for a conversation on Albany's journey from blight to bright. Please welcome Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan and Sammy Hoy, President of Maryland Institute College of Art. Good afternoon. We just heard a panel on um, revitalization of city neighborhoods. And as we all know, one of the most effective strategies to engage public imagination, discourse, and action in tackling tough urban issues is public art. And we now have the opportunity to learn through a, an extraordinary public art installation and uh, through a dialogue with um, Mayor Sheehan, who not only greenlit the project, but actively steered it to success and for maximum impact. And the project is called Breathing Light, and it was one of four national winners out of 237 applications that um, uh, answered the uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies Public Art Challenge. And the um, it's a scope is regional in scope, uh, involving three cities, cities of Albany, Schenectady, and Troy, and it won a million dollars, so it's a very, very big grant. The project called for increased awareness, but also concrete actions to address um, urban blight. And the project was on view from September 30th to November 30th, 2016, so quite recent. The engagement numbers during the run of the projects were truly impressive. It illuminated 200 vacant houses nightly uh, in the three cities, conducted 40 tours, and also 50 workshops, um, and, in, uh, and also involved 75 of, um, regional partners. It got attention in 91 countries and were very well covered uh, in media. In addition, the million dollar Bloomberg grant was leveraged for 3.5 million uh, further implementation uh, funding. So Mayor Sheehan, um, can you comment uh, on, uh, on this? As a public art project, Breathing Lights had to be an exquisite art installation, but also address as um, important and civic uh, issue as urban blight. And can you comment on in this instance, how what art brought to the table that were unique that other engagement strategies could not? It was really faceted because the city of Albany is located uh, in upstate New York, and we have two cities, Schenectady and Troy, that are literally 15 minutes away. And but they are in different counties, and they are three cities that historically had not had not worked well together. Uh, there had not been a long history of collaboration and cooperation, yet we shared this issue of vacant and abandoned buildings. And so it was an opportunity for us to come together using the arts, and it helped to open that door to cooperation and collaboration. It was something that we knew was possible, but that just hadn't occurred over time or organically. And so it was an opportunity to use the arts to bring these three cities together and to start to focus the talent that existed in those cities to look at this problem through a new lens. But did the arts um, demonstrate particular way of engaging the public? Absolutely. And again, it was sometimes when you talk about governments working together, we kind of tend to get in our in the way as opposed to uh, the arts community where there was just a very collaborative approach that was brought by the different arts organizations. They had worked together in the past. They had built bridges and relationships among the three cities. And so it was an opportunity to leverage that arts community to bring government together. Well, let's take a look at a short video that show you visually the power of the installation. Vacant properties are abandoned for all sorts of reasons. Every industrial city that has lost industry, lost economy, lost population is suffering the same thing. I want to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies for the award of this grant. It's fitting for it to be aimed at a problem that's so large as distressed property and vacant buildings. Breathing Lights decided to come in and say, yes, we're going to do an art project that brings awareness about these abandoned buildings. I'm on board. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We installed a lighting panel in the shape of the window and powered it with batteries. The breathing effect is creating the image of a kind of imagined occupancy. And at the same point in time, it's anthropomorphizing every building into kind of a living creature. The idea is to have lights that appear to breathe, reflecting that the property still has life. It was like a CPR project. 
They're being placed in hundreds of homes in Troy, Schenectady, and Albany. The neighborhood ambassadors are interacting with their own neighbors on a daily basis. Now that the buildings are breathing, they're really going to be put to the test. And this is exactly what Breathing Lights does. It cultivates. A part of the tours of what I'm doing is taking a detailed route in a three block path. And on that path alone, we pass about 17 abandoned buildings. That's huge. Personally, I think it is beautiful. It's giving the buildings life. The music that used to be played there, the food that used to be cooked in that kitchen, you're reminded of the family that used to live there. It makes people stop and look at the issue. There's a conversation that's going on, man, all across the, this capital region, and hopefully it's going to go across the whole nation also. In any one city, it would be an art project, but across the whole region, it's a form of activism. I'm very hopeful that this will kickstart a trend for people to really think twice about living in these neighborhoods where they might not have before. Bloomberg Philanthropies has the foresight to understand the powerful transformation that arts can bring to a community. Art speaks volumes. You start to think about what that art is, what it could do, and it cultivates an activism in you. So as you can see, this, the project was simply stunning. But the reality is that it was on for two months. And you let and mobilized partners across sectors to leverage long-term impact through a temporary project. Can you share with us some of your key goals, strategies, and outcomes, and any policy changes beginning to happen because of the project? So the overarching goal was to start to think differently about these buildings and to get people to the table to have a conversation, one around not only how did they we get to this place, but what are the things that we can do to change it? Because these are neighborhoods that matter. It was really important that this not be a project where we were just putting poverty on display, and that it be a project that was about neighborhoods that existed, decline that occurred because of things that were really outside of the control of the people living in these neighborhoods and in these communities. And so it helped us to have that, those conversations. And that's why it was really important to include ambassadors from the neighborhoods, to include local arts organizations to be hubs in each of the neighborhoods that we uh, were doing these projects, and, and to include as many of those partners as we possibly could. Great. And I understand that the, um, the city um, ambassadors were actually the ones who took the tour, so they could actually tell people that people used to live in buildings and really um, gave almost oral history and anthropological approach to understanding urban blight. That's right, and there were also arts projects that were connected with this. So we engaged local artists and we had events that occurred in all three cities uh, on multiple occasions over the course of the time that the lights were breathing. Right, and also the workshops were holistic. Uh, workshop, so it's not just about finding property, buying it, but also understanding how to tap into financial resources, how to responsibly restoring property. So, and, and a number of properties actually ended up um, being acquired. That's right. And the other piece of it was that we really focused on how we could work together as three cities. So, if you went to a housing workshop in the city of Troy and you got a certification, you qualified to purchase certain vacant buildings in Troy. So we said, well, if the person has gotten the certification in Troy, they should be able to use it to buy a vacant building in the city of Albany. It's really figuring out how do we work together to ensure that we're bringing the best practices in each of the three cities and lifting those up and providing them to one another and utilizing those tools so that we could get more of these buildings into the hands of people who want them. And it was very important that that be a part of this project, not just the arts aspect of it, but what do we do about these buildings? And there were social justice issues that we talked about. There was a lot that happened over the course of preparing for this because we had many public meetings as we led up to the lighting of the buildings as well as during the time that the lights were on. So again, the engagement numbers were impressive, the you know funding numbers um, were stunning. But this is real life, so we know that when implement a project as complex on the grounds as this, there must have been tensions and difficulties that can be overcome. So can you share with us some of the major lessons learned? 
Well, some of the issues were around the community, and there were people in these communities, in these, in these neighborhoods, who said, I don't want this here. And even after the buildings were lit, there were some that talked about the fact that it was an attractive nuisance to children. And so we had to address certain issues even after the buildings were lit to ensure that it was seen by the community as something that was safe and that was there as part of something that was going to help to transform that community. Uh, you know, there were technical issues associated with the lights, that the batteries needed to be switched out, but we used all of those as opportunities to engage the community and to hire local youth, for example, example, to be responsible for switching out batteries, to be involved in the installation. And so each of those hurdles we used as an opportunity to deepen the engagement that was happening. And how did you answer to citizens who ask, you've got a million dollars, you could actually renovate a whole block you know, with that, and why put that into an art project? Well, it was an art project, and so this was an opportunity to use the arts to leverage the resources that existed in all three cities. And it has resulted in attention being brought to this issue. Uh, the city of Albany, for example, received funding from the Attorney General's office because one of the things that we realized is that there wasn't one person in the city who every day their job was to get up and think about our vacant and, ban and abandoned buildings. It was spread out among our codes department and our planning department and the mayor's office. And so we needed to fund a position where we had somebody who this was what they were thinking about every day. And because of the attention that we were able to bring to this, we were able to make a really compelling grant application and get a position funded for two years to bring that uh, talent on board. It also brought together the community foundation in, our, uh, in the capital region. And they have leveraged all three cities in the work that we've done to tap into regional economic development money that is available and make a very compelling application for using that funding to further the work of bringing back these buildings. A million dollars doesn't go far. One of the issues with these buildings is that you know they, they are very expensive to renovate. And even with historic tax credits, and even with grants that are available, and even with banks who are willing to pull together special financing packages, sometimes we just can't make the numbers work. And so the resource that we need far exceeds a million dollars. Okay, great. I'll just be louder. Um, uh, so it sounds like the... Oh. Yes, okay, great. So, yeah. Partnership, collaboration on the spot. So, um, so it sounds like a million dollars you used to actually, instead of fixing a very concrete, limited solution, is to create a platform for actually many pronged solutions to come later on. Exactly. Yeah. Great. And also it resulted in a task force now, uh, and also the position, as I understand, it's called a Neighborhood Stabilization Coordinator, but it's nicknamed Vacant Building Czar. So, so we have actually two concrete uh, results out of that. And I understand also that Breathing Lights is now generating an impact report uh, beyond the engagement numbers. Can you share with us some of the indicators of how this is actually concretely affecting the issue of vacancy and urban blight? So we are... Uh continuing to study this. We partnered with the Center for Women in Government and Civil Society to really focus on the follow-up uh, associated with this and to measure outcomes. We have a land bank in the city of Al in the county of Albany. Uh, most of the properties that are in that land bank are in the city of Albany. They have closed on over a hundred properties. They have a hundred in the pipeline. We have done some of the things that you heard about today. Uh, they're, they're selling uh, vacant lots on streets to people who live on those streets for a hundred dollars. You know, the types of efforts, we, we've also launched a million dollars in grant money that is available uh, to be used to revitalize vacant buildings. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's owner-occupied or rental, but if it's rental, it has to be affordable. So we're really looking at leveraging all of the different tools that we have. And the fact that we did Breathing Lights, again, allowed us to tap into what was working in Troy and what was working in Schenectady and vice versa. And it has now become a regional conversation that has pulled together people who lived in our suburban areas, who were very interested in the arts and were drawn by the arts aspect of this, probably hadn't really thought a lot about these neighborhoods, probably hadn't really spent any time in these neighborhoods, and now have a renewed understanding of the obligation that we have as a region to address these issues in our cities. Great. And to what other cities do you look for best examples or inspiration for um, 
efforts in tackling urban blight? Flint, Michigan was one of the first cities that we talked to about even creating a land bank. Land banks were something that were created in New York State about seven years ago. Uh, there was legislation that was passed that allowed land banks to be created. And so we looked at what was working and what wasn't working in Flint with respect to their land bank. For us, the land bank is a great tool because it allows us to be more aggressive in our code enforcement because now we have a place for that building to land. Right before it was a long foreclosure process, the county was the foreclosing entity. Uh, you know, it was it was not uh, as easy to aggressively try to get to a building before it got to a point of disrepair where it was really something that was far too expensive to renovate or it needed to be torn down. So that has really helped us to jumpstart what we've been able to do in the capital region. We have so many more questions, but very limited time. So I have to conclude with this question. Um, in Baltimore, we're very lucky to have a mayor who understands and embraces art and design. So in Baltimore, we're going to take on a similar large scale public art project with similar goals. What would be your advice to us? I think it is starting early and engaging the community. We fell in love with this project before we had really talked to the neighborhoods that were going to be impacted about it. And so that did cause early on some issues around what was going to happen, what it was going to look like, why we were doing this, why we were spending a million dollars on the arts instead of in their community or on a, you know, at a, uh, you know they, wanting a neighborhood center. So it, that conversation needs to start almost at the beginning. The way that we were able to overcome that was to engage local arts entities who already had legitimacy in these neighborhoods and had been working in these neighborhoods to help us to develop those relationships and to uh, really listen and be able to have those deep meetings. But that really is, uh, for me, the one walk away because I sat through some uncomfortable meetings where there were people who were vocal and they were angry and it took a lot of work to be able to build that trust. But then to a person, once it was installed and once it was up, there were even more incredible conversations that occurred that I think has helped us to build bridges to these neighborhoods that probably would not have existed. Right. And also in Baltimore, we do know that unless you're willing to engage in difficult conversations, you actually don't move far. So absolutely. Um, and a little advertisement uh, in the chat with Mayor Xian um, right outside in the green room. We understand that this project is highly replicable and all the um, uh, mechanisms actually are in package, ready to be shared with. Well, Baltimore I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to overcommit, but I okay, understand right. that we do have a <laughs> number of them in here. storage. But certainly, you know, you saw the artists, the two artists that were in the video, and you know, they are really willing to share what they learned and how they made this happen. And I think it's really important because we have to have these conversations. These neighborhoods didn't get this way by accident. They got this way because of racism. They got this way because of policies that were implemented at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. And when you're able to engage in those conversations, it then does allow us to move past that. Not that it is something that we don't ever talk about again, because we have to keep talking about it, but it allows us to then, I think, engage at a deeper level as to what our moral obligation is. And when we talk about equity, and the past panel talked about equity, equity is not equal. Equity is looking at neighborhoods that were neglected for decades and recognizing that that is where we need to focus our resources. And so that conversation is another thing that has come out of this. And I'm so grateful to Bloomberg Philanthropies for doing this because it was bold, it was right, and it works. Public arts can make us uh, come to the table and have conversations that otherwise sometimes we get in our corners and we're just not willing to have them. No, thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights with us. And, and truly, 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 Wonderful food for thought for Baltimoreans who are also thinking about comprehensive strategies in combating urban blight in our own city. So let's not forget art as being a really important force in building awareness, generating social capital, and also leveraging investment. And we need to also um, end with um, the best wishes. Mayor uh, Sheehan is seeking a second term. So let's, uh, let's wish her a landslide success in winning a second term.